Okay, I'm going to I'm going to begin. Pastor George didn't tell me he wasn't coming today cuz he knew I would have got my rap crew together here. We would have been spitting rhymes and everything. But anyway, one day this week I had to go to the doctor. I told the doctor, I say, every morning I wake up, I look in the mirror, and I want to throw up. What's wrong with me? He said, I don't know, but your eyesight is perfect. <laughs> in fact, one day I needed money, so I entered an ugly contest. And when I showed up there, they said, sorry, no professional. <laughs> so, okay, that's the end of that. So I'm going to be doing part two of um, last week. I did a message called Better Together, which was all about the farmer and the seeds and the crops and the harvest. And what I spoke about last week was how God put seed into your hand if you're a child of God in order to create your miracle, in order to receive what you're believing for, that God doesn't do it all for you, but he works together with you. And he gives you seeds to begin to be able to have faith and grow and believe. Well, I'm going to be speaking again about seeds, not about the seeds that God puts in your hand, but I'm going to talk about the seed that God places in you. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, it says, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. In other words, if you love Jesus, if you've been born again by the Spirit, and you are a child of God, you're not doing this on your own, but the very seed of the creator of the universe lives in you. It resides in your spirit. All the creativity and the power of God, the victory, resides in you, but it's in you in seed form. See, when you become a Christian, God plants that seeds, seed in you. So you might ask, well, if the seed of God is in me, why do I struggle still so much? Why do I still have so much problem believing and so, so, so much in my spiritual walk? Why is it so hard? Well, what I said was it gives you a seed, but you have the responsibility for it to grow. It's your job to create an environment in your life where the very seed of God begins to take root, begins to grow and bear fruit. So I'm going to read a story in the Bible that's all about this. It's in Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 3. And then I'm going to go down to verse 8 and then skip down to verse 14. It says, listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell among the, along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed, seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, and some 100 times. So now I'm going to go down to verse 14 where Jesus is going to explain what this means. The farmer sows the word. So the word that's being planted in the ground is God's word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan or the devil comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. 
Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desire for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. And so the farmer with the seed rep represents the seeds that were sown into you. It can represent Jesus speaking to you. It could represent what I'm doing right now. I'm like a farmer right now. I got this big bag of seeds, and I'm just throwing them out and seeing where they're going to land. See, back in Bible times, I didn't have those fancy machines where the seed goes right into the hole. All, they had farmers that had a big bag of seeds, and he'd just walk around throwing it where he could. You see, all the seeds were the same. No matter where he threw the seed, it was the same seed. But the difference was the soil, which symbolically means everyone's hearing the word I'm preaching right now, but not everyone's hearing it the same. Not everybody's receiving it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break this down. I'm going to go back to verse 14. It says, the farmer sows the word. Some some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. See, Satan is the devil. In other words, we don't talk about him all that much because we, we don't want to get him that much attention. But you have a spiritual enemy that will try to stand against you anytime you try to move forward. The good news is that he has been overcome by the blood of Jesus. We don't have to fear him. He doesn't have authority over us, but he will try to deceive you or wear you out. So some of the seeds that the farmer throws, it says it goes along the path And the birds come and they take it away. You know what that represents? You're sitting in the service. You're hearing the preaching. But right away, the devil comes and snatches it up. Maybe you're sitting right now and checking your messages on your phone. Some of you, here's a good one. Some of you are pretending you're on the Bible app and you're, and you're interacting on Facebook, but you're looking like you're there in the Word, you're attentive. I think I did that a couple times. I, some, some of you are fast asleep, but you're acting as if you're deep in the Spirit. Every now and then you nod or you raise your hand and you go back to sleep. Some of you, you're already in the restaurant where you're going to eat lunch. You're already dreaming about the pork chops. <laughs> you know what's happening? The enemy's coming and snatching the word so that it can't get into you. See, when we have messages and preaching and teaching or people prophesy over you or encourage you. They're not just trying to make you feel good. They're planting seeds in your heart, believing that God's going to do something through it. We have to begin to be serious about the word of God. We don't want the enemy to come and snatch it away. Verse 16, others like seeds sown on rocky places, in other words, other people, like seeds sown on rocky places, 
hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. In other words, some people show up in the church and they have an emotional experience. They get all excited. They get goosebumps and liver quivers. Oh, that was worship was great. Oh, I was really touched during that service. But because of the hardness of their heart, the scripture says, the, the word never took root. The experience they had with God was just a passing or a momentary thing. See, when it talks about rocky soil, it doesn't mean soil filled with stones and pebbles. But in Israel, where this took place, in the farmland, there's sheets of rock in some places underneath the soil. And if you plant a seed on top of it, there's no place for the roots to, to come. And that's what happens with many of us. We can't receive because we've allowed walls to be built between us and God. It could be because of disappointed. Some of you might be disappointed with God here right now. You might be, oh, I thought by now I'd be married. Oh, I thought by now I'd have the money I'm praying for. I thought by now that my husband would have changed. And you could become disappointed with God and you could come to church every day and sit in worship and there's no place for it to take root. You got to tear down anything that stands between you and God. See, some of you are angry at God. You blame him for things that happen. Somebody recently told me, well, if God is so good, why did he send my idiot ex-boyfriend? God did not send your idiot ex-boyfriend. You never asked God. That jerk that, that came into your life, that job you took that turned out to be a bomb, did you ask God before you took it? Before you hooked up with this bomb? Did you feel the peace of God in you? Not, you know how people say everything happens for a reason? I don't play that. <laughs> Half the time the reason it happened is because of the dumb decisions we make. <laughs> and then we say, oh, God did that for a reason. I know there were, there were, I don't know why God, God never did it. We have to stop blaming God. And even in those things that God did do, there's purpose in it. There's destiny in it. God's not going to do anything in your life that's not going to make you greater and move you forward. Some of you have been so hurt by life that you've put a shield around your heart and you even refuse to allow God in. You, you won't even trust him because so many people have hurt or abused you that even thinking, I can't even trust God. Some people say, some people have hard hearts because their attitude is, I love God but I want to live how I want to live. If you want to live how you want to live, you don't love God. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. It doesn't mean you'll do everything perfect. It doesn't mean you're going to be a pastor. It doesn't mean you'll be a role model to the world. But it means you care. It means you're pressing forward. See, I was at that place almost exactly 20 years ago where I was going through such a hard time and so much difficulty that I couldn't even pray. I would actually come to church and, and leave halfway through the service even though I was in ministry. My heart started to get hard. I would try to read the Bible and read one page like 40 times and say, I can't do this. 
And, if, and then one day I had an encounter with God where I was totally changed forever. But I was heading in the wrong direction. Even being in ministry. Even standing up in pulpits and preaching, but my heart was becoming hard and bitter. You have to watch out. I don't care if you're a pastor. I don't care if you've been saved for 30 years. Don't allow the things you experience to give you a hard heart so that you can't receive those words anymore. So I'm going to go now to verse 18. Still others, or still other people, are like seeds sown among thorns. They hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. In other words... That some of us, we hear the word, we begin to believe it, we start to try to live it out, but all the problems of the world and the things that, that worry us and the bill, and many times we carry other people's burdens. You know, it's great when you could help people, but you were not created, you, you, you weren't built to be a burden carrier, that's God's job. He'd say, cast your burdens on me. If people try to dump their problems on you, you, can, you try to help. But you can't carry people. You can't put people on your back and try to drag them through life because what you do is make people dependent on you. I'll tell the truth. There, there are people that I've known 20 years. They never change. They all have the same problem. And when I see the caller ID, I make sure I don't answer the phone. Because I know all they want to do is drag me down with them. They're not willing. All the words I spoke to them, all the encouragement, all the scriptures I sent them, it goes down into a hole and the cares of the world just choke it out. Another thing that will choke the seed is when you're focused on what God is not doing. You can be so focused on what's not happening. Oh, I've been in this job and I, everyone else got a promotion. I, I'm married all these years and nothing changes. And you can get so focused on what God's doing that you could, that you could keep hearing the word. God's trying to get your attention. He's trying to do something in your life. And, and those cares just choke out everything he wants to do. See, a lot of times God's ready to move on your behalf. He's trying to work a miracle and you could stop him. Did you know that you have responsibility? If you want God to work in your life, in your finances, in your marriage, <coughs> You better make sure that those things are not choking out what God's trying to do in you. A lot of times we can feel, people feel overwhelmed by life and they start to isolate themselves. You know, you can't live this life alone and have victory. Oh, but it's just me and Jesus. I don't need anyone else, just me and Jesus. I said last week, I can't personally, I can't survive on my own. I need the people of God. You never walk away or isolate yourself because it's so easy for the enemy to choke the seed out of you if it's just you. If there's no one standing with you, if nobody's encouraging you or praying for you or making you accountable... See, there's so many things that can compete for your time, your energy, resources, and attention. 
that there's no way for you to focus on what really matters and what God wants to do in you. Remember I said God's seed is in you. That's seeds of greatness. Those are powerful seeds. God wants you to grow and mature and fulfill your purpose and your destiny. But when everything else is robbing your time and the only thing of God you have is when you show up Sunday morning, that seed will never grow. you got to keep watering it and nurturing it. <coughs> then the scripture talked about the deceitfulness of wealth will also choke out the seed. What is the deceitfulness of wealth? You might say, well, I don't have that problem. I don't have any money anyway. Here's what the deception is. The deception is a belief that money and things will give you the joy and peace and self-esteem you're looking for. You sit and compare yourself to other people. Oh, if I only had a house like them. Oh, if I only had money in my bank like that person. If you think the rich and famous are so happy, try watching Entertainment Tonight or read People magazine. All the drugs, alcohol, divorce, eating disorders, the depression. People who have everything in this world where you're saying, if I only had what they had, I know I'd be happy. I, then I'll be satisfied. That is the deceitfulness of wealth. If you're not happy right now, you won't be happy if I give you a million dollars. That's what happens with most of these lottery winners that win all these millions. Within a couple of years, the money's gone and they're more miserable than they were before because they were under the impression, if I only win the lottery, then everything's going to be great in my life. Nothing changes. Your outward circumstance cannot bring you the joy that only God can give you. And then it talks the desire for other things. It doesn't really, it's not really specific about what that means, the desire for other things in our life that chokes out the word. But I have a good idea. Th those are the people that said, I wish I had a marriage like so and so. I'm not happy in my marriage, but I wish I had a husband or a wife like that person. You don't know what's going on in that person's house. I've seen so many marriages that I thought was the perfect example. This is the perfect marriage, and the next thing you know, the whole thing crumbled. Always pointing if only this, if only I didn't have to deal with that idiot co-worker, I'd be so happy. You're not going to be happy even when the co-worker leaves if you're not happy right now. You've got to find your contentment in the Lord. The things of this world are not going to change anything. If you're single, I see people, they're so consumed with getting married. I oh. My life is a mess now, but once God brings me the maid I'm praying for, it's all going to fall into place. Boy, are you under a deception. If you're not satisfied now, if you're not at peace now, it's just going to bring more trouble. You have to get that thing out of your head. If only... If only this happened, then, it, then, the, then I'll be so glad. Everything will work together. It's a right, God is a right now thing. He can't move you forward in your life if you can't find contentment with him right now in, in your situation. He'll shine right in your dark place, whatever you're going through. But stop just looking about 
looking into the future and saying, well, when, once I get there, then uh, it'll be smooth sailing. It's not smooth sailing if it's not now in you. This is all about God in you, the seed he's put in you. I want to read a quote from T.D. Jakes. This is actually part of, a little part of his sermon. He said, stop watering things that were never meant to grow in your life. Water what works, what's good, what's right. Stop playing around with those dead bones and stuff you can't fix. It's over, leave it alone. You're coming into a season of greatness. If you water what's alive and divine, you will see harvest like you've never seen before. Stop wasting water on dead issues, dead relationships, dead people, a dead past. No matter how much you water concrete, you can't grow a garden. If you're really serious about this God thing, you got to get focused. You, gotta, you have to begin to nurture the seed God put in you. You have to get with him. If this is just a nice place to come on Sundays, because I like to have a spiritual part of my life, and the kids enjoy it, so I come to church, I can't help you. I got no, I, no matter what I tell you, it's not going to make a difference. There's no word I could say that's going to change your situation if this is just one part of your life among many others. See, God has to be the center. It's God that I live for. It's God that I pursue. That's all the songs you've been singing. If you didn't mean it, don't sing it. You see, God believes you when you sing these songs. Pastor Ephraim, he picks out which songs God is showing him every week. And these are songs where you're standing up saying, God, you're the center of my joy. I, you, I am passionate for you. And then we leave here and we forget about them till next Sunday, other than reading some nice posts on Facebook. And that seed in you is never going to grow. It's going to get choked out. I'm going to go down to verse 20. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. <clears throat> I've seen many people in this church right here, maybe they came in broken, wounded, but their heart was hungry. They, had pre they were willing they humbled themselves, and, and the word was put in them, and the prophetic words, and God's promises. And those few seeds begin to spring up and multiply, and these are people that are doing way more than you'd ever expect. 30, 40, 100 times more. You see, God, God wants to multiply you. He wants to do great things for you, but it's all about the soil. It's all about your heart. And I'm going to, rather than explain it, I'm going to give you some examples right now. So I'm going to ask Courtney and David to come. I, I want to show you two people that, pre that allowed their hearts to be broken for God and we're already seeing those seeds grow and multiply. Good morning. God bless you all. My name is Courtney. For those who don't know, I'm Jessica's daughter. She testified last week. I'm the oldest, my brother. Um, 
I'm really nervous. My heart is like almost jumping out my chest. But basically, I grew up in a Pentecostal church. My mom and my dad used to go to the same church. Whatever happened, happened, and then we stopped going. But then when I was 14, my dad decided he wants to go back to church, so we went. And um, I like church and with stuff like that, so we were going to a specific church, and I was doing God's work, and I was doing everything for God. And I was starting to grow in the Lord, but then stuff happened in that church, and then we stopped going. And around that time, my mom was an atheist and stuff like that, like she's testified before. And I was trying to get her to go to church, and she didn't want to go to church. And then around when I was like 16, um, I started falling, and I didn't want to go to church anymore. And that's when she started going to church, and I was like, really, you're going to go to church? And I don't want to go to church. And she would force us to go. And every Sunday was an argument about how it wasn't fair that when I was going, she didn't want to go. And now she's trying to force me to go when I don't want to go. And it was just this whole big thing. And then a lot of stuff happened in my life that I just, that I wasn't home for a good reason. I wasn't home. And then um, I started drinking a lot and I would get bored with my life and I would start doing drugs and I would start smoking and I was doing all this thing. I was doing all these things that in my spirit I knew I shouldn't have been doing, but at the same time it was fun for me and I was just like, whatever, that I care in the world. I didn't care about my life. I didn't care about anything. So I was just doing stuff just to do it and just to find other ways to like escape the world and stuff like that. And I would spend a lot of nights crying, asking God to take my life, to take me, and it was just horrible. And the more I did the drugs and the more I drank, the more my spirit was dying and the more I started seeing my spirit dying. Like, I, I don't know, I feel like when your spirit is better, you see it in your face, your face is lighter and stuff like that. And when you're doing spiritually bad, you look paler, you look different, you look everything. So. I started realizing that, and I'm like, wow, this isn't good. So my mom would still force me to go to church. Sometimes I would go to church here and there. I'll pop up here and there, and then the service will be about me, and then I'll be like, all right, I don't like this church. I'm leaving. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, so um, I was, the, the, the glory to God, I was never a drug addict because the amount of times I did drugs was bad, and I should have been addicted to drugs, but glory be to God, I was not a drug addict. Um, I did drink a lot. I did have a really big problem with drinking, and I, I'm still fighting the drinking now. But um, last year, around September 18th, me and my brother decided to get baptized. I got I came into church one day just like, all right, I'm going to go to church. Everybody's getting baptized for my family, so I'm just going to go to church. My brother asked me if I was getting baptized, and I was like, no, I don't want to get baptized. But then I felt the Spirit tell me to get baptized. And so I did, and when I was coming to church, when I was here on the line to get baptized, I was hyperventilating. I almost passed out. It was this whole big thing. But I felt different when I came up, and that week I felt good. But then those few months after my baptism was, like, the hardest thing in the world for me. It was the hardest battle. That's when I started trying well, was, That's when I wanted to drink more. That's when I wanted to do all these things. And everything and it increased. And I was like, you know what? I shouldn't have gotten baptized. It wasn't my time to get baptized yet. So maybe I should just, like, you know, stop going to church and everything like that. And I doubt it, like, if my spirit was actually hearing God, if it was hearing, like, you know, the devil's voice and stuff like that and I was just addicted to a lot of things like not like addicted addicted but like you know like when whatever like addicted to like sex drugs drinking everything like that so um around New Year's though I decided that I was gonna like do everything I got really drunk for New Year's like I was really drunk for New Year's and then I was like you know what this isn't good I'm just gonna leave this in 2016 so I, I, I didn't really have a problem with giving up smoking weed and doing the drugs, but the drinking, I would drink here and there throughout this year. And, um, but what I would do was I would like, I was locked up in my room f for a lot of times for months, isolating myself just with me and God, because I felt like, I know it's not good to do, but I felt like that was something that I needed to do because my spirit, I had a spirit of anger, I had a spirit of everything. So it would just be arguments and arguments every time I was in the house. I felt like the house wasn't peaceful and stuff like that. So. I would force myself to listen to worship music for an hour and fast for that hour and read the Bible and pray and just get myself, my spirit back up. And it was very hard and it still is hard for me to do sometimes when I'm not doing good. But I, I realized that it's never going to be easy if we just continue saying, I, oh, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this and stuff like that. And like, like Pastor Gary said, when you want to do something for God, that's when the devil comes in and he, like, starts, like, tempting you, like, oh, you don't really want to do this. God's not really telling you to do this. Or, like, you get tired or you get bored or it's boring. But if you force yourself to do it, you'll become accustomed to it and then your spirit will start to long for it. 
And if you stop doing it after a while of getting, like, longing for it, your spirit will long for it, and then you'll feel, like, wrong for not, like, doing, reading the Bible or praying and stuff like that. So I'm realizing now that um, I like listening to worship music a lot. I like to sing a lot. I'm, I'm always having a song in my head, and I'm starting to read the Bible and trying to, go, like, dive deeper in the Bible, and I find myself praying at random times now. So it's like I, I like... If you don't see yourself, like, even if you don't feel like you're growing, somebody else will come to you, like, oh, my gosh, I see you growing. I see you doing so much better spiritually. And you're like, really? I don't feel that way. But people do see it when, when, you're, when you're making a difference and when you're trying to attempt to do something. So, yeah. Hi, everybody. Forgive me, this is like odd. I, I, I'm not normally coming up and talking to everybody. Um, so I'm just gonna make it seem like I'm talking to like everybody, just at once. Okay. <sighs> okay, so, my sister, she did a really good introduction. Um, I'm not sure if I could really like uh, go above that because she was just an open book. I didn't plan on being an open book. Uh, <laughs> But she's, she's great with that, um, being unexpected. So I kind of, um, I found a uh, scripture that I was, I feel like it kind of pertained to me. Um, just because I, if you know me, you kind of know that I don't really worry about stuff. And when I do worry about stuff, it's like, like too much. Like I should be bald by how much I worry. Um, so anyway, here is the scripture. It's uh, Matthew 6, 26. It says, look at the birds in the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of his life? Right? Okay. So around that time, right, because my sister gave the whole history of when we started to go back to church and then left and then came back again. Well, there was like a third time that we actually came back and this would be our third time. The very first time we actually went to church was with our father. Cause he was like really pushing us to go because it was big to him at the time because he was getting back into it. So it was a, it was a good introduction. It was, it, it was good that he did that so that we could have that that foundation in our life already. That's something that's known to us, it's not foreign. So, after we got tired of going to church with him, right? Um, we, we found a church that was pretty good. Like we enjoyed it because of, I wanna say, I really do wanna say that God legit like impacted us right there in that church. But I feel like, and I think my sister kind of feels it too, like we were going more for the people there because they were relatable. They were a little cooler than the, the first church we were going to, which was the Pentecostal thing. And it's not like it's like a bad thing, but it's like it's, it's just kind of a little too much, too much, too quick. A lot of the religion, I can't deal with it. So, right, we finally found some place that we thought was a safe haven where we could talk about what we're going through with people that were more of our age. We weren't talking to like somebody that's like 53 and it's like, oh, it's going to be all right. I'm like 13. I'm like, dude, I don't know. Like, um, but it, so that, that, that wasn't really there for me, but now talking to somebody that's like, that's like 18, 19, like they kind of just went through it and they're like, listen, it's not as bad as you think it is. Cause this is from what I remember. And this is what I did that kind of helped me get through it. So that was better. Right? So we learned <laughs> that it's not really a good thing to go to a church just for the people. It's. Like, it, you got to go because you had an experience there. Plus, the people of the church are just great. So, yeah, you know. So, going back to what my sister said about when you're strong in the spirit and when your spirit is, like, there, there's, like, a glow. And at that time, the, the, the church that we were going to for the people, not, ugh, I can't keep saying that, but whatever. They had noticed that when I first got there, to where I was later on when, I, when they were talking to me a couple months down the line, they were saying I had a glow to me that it doesn't look like I'm just like there. You know, I'm not just standing there. When people stand up, I stand up. When they sit down, I sit. When they open the Bible, I open, put my finger there, and it's like, 
yeah, they read that. Like, I was, I was that person. I, was, I would do everything everybody did, but it was, it was going in and out. So I knew that it was either get into it at that time where I can meet God because God was already meeting me or just, like, fall back and just let whatever happened happen. But I didn't really develop that mentality until I read this scripture because I never really thought, hmm, how do birds eat? Like, it, it never applied to me because I figured, oh, you know, birds are always all around us. And some people are just, are just like that. They just throw, like, pieces of bread to bird or whatever. So that's what I kind of figured about it. But I didn't think deeper, like, okay, but now when these birds aren't around humanity, how are they eating? Well, God's providing for them. Like, they're not sitting there worried about it. God, they know God will provide for them. So that's what I, I, I figured that out in that church. God will provide for us even when we don't ask. And that was a lot to take in because growing, being younger, I, I used to ask for a lot. And I, I kind of learned that I shouldn't really ask for much if I'm not giving much. So <laughs> knowing that, like, <laughs> all this stuff that I've done, that I have done, I have done, that I have done that was offensive to God, like, knowing I'm still, like, at the center of his hand among with everybody in the church and humanity, like, it was difficult for me at the time. Like, I had to wrestle with it because, it, like, I, I didn't really do horrible, but I wasn't doing great, and I knew it because I knew that I knew God enough to do better than what I was doing at the time. So before leaving that church, I decided, you know what, because they were doing some type of event or whatever where you would write on a paper what you want God to do for you in that year. And in that year, I wanted knowledge about the Bible. And I got that knowledge. And I think it was a little too much knowledge because it, it kind of, I don't want to say I strayed, but like I did fall hard, like, like a free fall. But then in that, the people that I had met when I was in the world, I didn't really hide it that I knew God. Like when God was being spoken about, I didn't, I didn't like let people speak bad about it. Like there was one person that I knew, Lord, I'm not saying this about you, but they had said, oh, they were, they were just like, F Jesus, ah, I don't like it. But I told them, I was like, listen, I know you're not, you don't know about it, but I know about it. Please, that is a very dangerous phrase to play around, even if you don't even mean it, but it's just, I don't want you to do or say something unintentional and then, like, that's just it, you know? Like, so I guess what I, or poetically, what I thought was happening was, okay, I, I got strong in the Lord, and then I fell, so now I'm here in this dark place to bring people up. I guess everybody goes to that, you know? Like, you think you're, you're, you're going to be that light for your friends when it's really, like, you kind of should, but, like, you're not going to be the whole light. Like, you just kind of instill that, and it's like, all right, God, now, nah, now you got to do your part told them about you. I, I don't want to say I revealed them to you. You know, that's, that's up to God, but I feel like you guys know what I mean. So, so finally, right, this whole journey comes back to being here. So when we get here, for my aunt first coming here and bringing the whole family, and it was great because everybody here was just so accepting, and it just, I just felt the love from when I first stepped in here, but I wasn't ready. Like everybody says they, they aren't, they're never ready to, to chase after God because they're so preoccupied with life and all this, that, and the third. But I figured out life happens regardless if we're chasing God or when we're not chasing God, life is going to happen. So now the biggest decision out of being here, which I didn't think I was going to do here, was getting baptized. And that by far was the greatest experience I've had. Really, it really was. And at the same time, uh, and I, I don't know. I feel like we all kind of go through the same thing. Did anybody else really, besides me and my sister, like kind of experience a storm right after baptism? Because I, I feel like that's just, that's just what happens. Like, you know, like that's, that's when the test is there. And glory be to God, we're getting through it. And yeah, I just thank God for getting us through things. Oh, wait. And, right? The worship, the last worship song we sang. Man, that is a great song. That song is just really great. I love it. I can hear it every time we come here, man. This is great. Because you're just trusting in God's promise. And 
That was it. This is great. So thank you guys for taking the time out to listen to us. <laughs>
I'm not judging you if that, that's fine, but you, it's not going to help you. We're here to help you. The, the reason we have a church is to help you to be who God called you to be. If you're content how you've been, then this is not for you. You might as well sit down. But if you're saying, I'm going to keep watering that seed, I'm not going to let the cares of the world strangle it out anymore. I'm keeping my eyes on God. Just receive right now. I just want to reinforce that scripture he said about casting your cares upon the Lord because he cares for you. He cares about our situations. He cares about what we're going through. We understand, you have to understand today that as believers, we're all going through the same type of sufferings. I may not be going where you're going to, but you may be going to the next person's going through. And it is a decision we make. It's a decision. I, I, we're in a season now, well, in every life is always a season, but I believe it's a season now where I'm not talking about outside, but in the church, there are people that are falling apart. And then I see other side of people where their success is happening. The same seed is being planted in both people, but the cares of the world are strangling those things out. And because the, as, as believers, we don't cast those things upon the Lord. What ends up happening is they strangle and then we fall. And we, we birth, a, we birth a, a, a season of destruction, a birth of a season of frustration and anger and brokenness. And it brings us back to a place where we're, we're like back in the world again, where we're flipping out and cursing and you know, doing, making decisions based on what, how our flesh feels. But if we cast our cares upon the Lord today and say, look, this is all what I'm going through is out of control. I don't know what to do. And that seed that's inside me, Lord, I want to be a place, a fertile ground where that, place is, that, that seed is going to grow and birth into something wonderful. Birth into things that I want, but birth into things that I'm hoping for in my heart that I cannot do on my own. If that's you today, I just want you to stand. If you're not standing, but I just want you to stand as a declaration saying, you know what? I don't have all the answers. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm believing today that God is going to do the seed that's in me is going to about to birth. So if, it's your, if, your, if your seed that's like, like drowning right now, that is lack of finances, I speak blessing over you in the name of Jesus. If it's frustration and anger inside of you, I speak peace over you right now in the name of Jesus. That that will birth out of you. I speak hope over you right now in the name of Jesus. I speak love. If there's a lack of love in you today and there's hurt and brokenness and you don't know how to just love the next person, I speak love over you today. I speak breakthrough where there is no breakthrough. But there's no way you can see the next day come to pass. I speak breakthrough over that situation. Let it grow in you today. It's a choice we make. God don't force himself upon us. He don't make things happen when we don't want them to happen. It's a choice. I pray you choose today. I pray God will give you faith in right now. If you lack faith, I speak faith, that seed of faith over you where you can believe to say, when I take this one step, Lord God, I trust that you're going to make things well with me. Where things are out of control and confusion and frustration amongst people, family, church, whatever it may be. I pray you lay it before God today and allow him to birth in you something wonderful. If, you're, if, if you were in the position where I am as leaders, where we, where we see everything, we know everything that goes on with people, and you see the brokenness of people, and see marriages and things falling apart, because you pour in and pour in and pour in, the people just say, no, 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 no. This is too big. This is too big. And we see other people, families that are growing, and you see breakthroughs happening, testimony after testimony. God's not in the perspective of persons. He doesn't look at you and look at the next person and say, no, 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 not him, just that one. That's not how God works. It's how we allow him inside for the seed to grow. Today, I pray that God will give you the strength today to say yes. Sometimes you can't even say yes to God. Sometimes you can't even say yes to the process of what God is going to do. But you're not alone. We all go through it. We all got to make the decisions. We all got to say yes. Even to the, the frustration when things are against us, we have to say yes to Jesus. So I pray today that your blessing will begin to birth out. I believe, I, I truly believe. I'm not talking like hocus pocus stuff because I, I don't believe a lot of that stuff too because I think a lot of it is just 
for, for emotional stuff, but I believe the Holy Spirit is real. And I believe if you say yes to Jesus, God's going to open doors for you, and God is going to make things happen where you can't imagine it happening. I had a lot of doubt. I'm going to be just a little short thing before they worship. I have a lot of doubt about a lot of things. I grew up in church. I, my dad's a pastor. My uncle's a pastor. Everything, everything like that. I grew up in that environment, and to me it was fake. Because the people I was surrounded were, they allowed the seed of God to grow in them. So all I would do is get hurt and get hurt and get hurt and get hurt. Until one day I cast, I let my seed before the Lord to grow in me. I said, Lord, I'm going to cast whatever frustration and anger I have in my heart. I'm going to give that to you, Jesus. And if you real, you make something happen. I begin to see a tree just grow up inside of me. And when I doubt it, I just did it again. I just did it again. Lord, I humble myself on near hand. I trust you they're going to do something wonderful in my life. And he did and he does and he always will do it. So we're believing for a revival in your life. We're believing for this tree that's inside of you to grow in these gifts and these abilities that God wants to use. We believe it to happen. Just cast your cares on God. Whatever's worry, anxiety, and frustration, just cast it on him today. And I declare over you will see breakthrough quickly. Not the years and the years that the locusts and the, the canker worm has stolen for you. But God's going to give you breakthrough quickly. All those times, how come God is doing this so quickly? I just said yes yesterday, but God has been wanting to work over and over for years, and we've been resisting God. And God is saying, when we say yes to Jesus, we're going to see an outpouring of blessing, an outpouring of victory and hope in our lives. So I declare, when you say yes to Jesus today, he's going to begin to move faster than you imagine. Amen? This is harvest season. If you know about anything about plants, and the winter time is coming. I, don't, I watched Game of Thrones. I don't know about you guys, but I watched Game of Thrones. You can pray for me later. But I'm just saying, winter is coming. And if we're confused about the battles that are around us and not focusing on what's about to happen, we're going to get swallowed up. We're better together as a team, right? If you watch, the Lord, if you watch Game of Thrones, that's what they're trying to do. Trying to put everybody together as a team. And together, we can say, yo, I'm going through the same nonsense you're going through. But let's lay that down before the Lord. I'm hurting my marriage because of you like you are. Let's lay that down before the Lord. Everything you're going to, we stick together, and we're going to see breakthrough together. Not on your own. A man by himself in an island is going to get destroyed. But together we're strong, right? Amen? Amen. Game of what? What do I know? See, you heard the testimony from Courtney that nine months ago, on New Year's Eve, she was out there drinking, and here she is today, sold out for the Lord, even in her struggles. But I watch her. She loves to worship. She takes in the Word. And if God could do that for her, He could do it for every one of you if you're ready to receive. So we're going to end in worship right now. And it's the worship that waters that seed in you. You come into the presence of God and you just let it begin to wash over the seed and watch it grow as you spend time with him.